Good afternoon, everyone. I begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands of which we meet on today. They are the lands of the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung people. I pay my respects to their elders, past and present, and welcome all First Nations people joining us here today. I acknowledge and respect the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people as this country's first scientists with deep and enduring knowledge of the lands and the waters and the skies. As Dean of Science and on behalf of the Deans of Medicine, Dentistry and Health Sciences and of in Engineering and Information Technology, I warmly welcome you to this cross-faculty event for International Women's Day. I extend a special thanks to our guest of honour, Professor Anne Kelso, uh, to the Provost, Professor Nicola Phillips, who I believe is going to be here, and to our Provost Chancellor of People and Equity, Professor Elaine Wong. Thank you very much to everyone for joining us today. <coughs> I also welcome Professor Natalie Hannon, who will be speaking with Anne uh, immediately after, after this. I welcome Professor Rachel Webster, Associate Professor Jenny Waycott, and Dr. Anka Singh, who will be joining us on the panel today. Thank you very much. Building on the success of last year's cross-faculty luncheon, we have again gathered to celebrate and inspire and support women in STEM, and that's STEM with two M's, one for medicine and one for mathematics. <laughs> but support is a very loose term. You can easily say you support women in STEM and simply mean that you're in <coughs> favour of the general concept without committing to do anything or providing anything tangible and practical. Whereas if you say you invest in women in STEM, that's a commitment of time or money or other resources. And the theme for this year's United Nations International Women's Day is Invest in Women, Accelerate Progress. Achieving gender equity and women's empowerment is one of 17 goals in the United Nations 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, and it's integral in achieving the other 16. In 2023, when reviewing progress against these global targets set in 20, uh, 2015, when the agenda was adopted, the United Nations found a staggering deficit of 360 billion US dollars in spending on gender equity measures. This failure to invest in women jeopardises the entire 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. This global situation is certainly distressing, but how are we doing nationally on gender equity? Last week, for the first time, the Australian Government released data reflecting the gender pay gaps at nearly 5,000 companies. So that's every private company with 100 or more employees. <coughs> The data paints a stark picture with an average pay gap of 19% in favour of male employees and gaps of 30 to 40% in some of the country's biggest and well-known employees. So in other words, men are still being appointed to far more of their share of senior positions, men are still making most of the decisions in these businesses and they are reaping more of the rewards. Clearly, these businesses need to move beyond the theoretical support to real investment in gender equity solutions. But what about the Australian government, Australian universities, this university, indeed the three faculties that are represented here? Are these institutions investing meaningfully in women in STEM? Or, we, or are we meaning only supporting them? Are we putting our money where our mouth is? The saying goes that time is money, so money can buy time. And in my experience, more time is what women in academia need. It's what we crave more than anything else. We need more time to focus on our research, really focus. We need more time to ponder, time to question, thinking time, writing time. Women in STEM need more time to attend and be present at conferences. Women in STEM need more time to apply for grants and awards time to sit on diversity and inclusion committees, to contribute to gender equity working groups and to nurture the next generation. Time to, to attend events like this. Time to join an expert panel. Time to network. Time to eat lunch. <laughs> of course, we also need time out. Time for our responsibilities and interests beyond work 
and time to do nothing, absolutely nothing. <laughs> To truly support women in STEM, to help achieve their full potential in their careers, to make positive change that they want to make in the world, to maintain the balance in their lives and sustain their physical and mental health, we must buy them time. We can buy time by investing in, for example, more professional staff to support our academics. We can buy women time by investing in better systems to streamline processes and reduce the administrative load. We can monitor and we can shift workloads. We can buy them time by investing in hiring more young women who will help share the load and create momentum. And then women in STEM won't feel like they can't keep up. They won't feel like they have to pretend that they don't have responsibilities beyond the workplaces. They won't feel that despite their love of STEM and their talent for research and teaching, a different career might actually have been a better choice because they would be less exhausted. They won't feel so angry about the inequity. When women in STEM have more time, they will feel more like they belong in STEM. And I want to assure everybody here, you absolutely belong here and I'll do everything, we'll do everything we can to make sure you see the value that we place in you. And now it's time to be much more lighthearted and talk about what we're going to do for the rest of the event. So I'm now about to hand over to uh, someone I am um, very privileged to call a friend as well as a colleague, and that's Professor Natalie Hannon, who is an ARC Future Fellow in the Melbourne Medical School, whose research career has been dedicated to improving the health of women and children, <coughs> who will join our guest of honour in what is certain to be an absolutely fascinating conversation. There will then be time for questions, after which we will have lunch, and then we will then move into the panel discussion. Again, there will be time for questions at the end of that. Before we draw the event to a conclusion and you return to your busy, far too busy lives, please welcome Natalie and thank you everyone for attending. Thanks so much, Moira, for that very kind introduction. I now have the great privilege as a huge fan of our guest, um, and I'll tell you why. <laughs> I'm going to introduce Professor Anne Kelso AO. Anne is a highly respected medical researcher in the field of immunology and vaccines. She's particularly known for her significant contributions to national and international science, community health and medicine. It's interesting, if you didn't know, Anne is a graduate of the Faculty of Medicine, Dentistry and Health Sciences, where she attained her PhD in 1980. After undertaking further immunology research here in Australia, as well as overseas, and moved into leadership roles to really foster research as well as pathways to better health and better health care. She has held directorship roles at the Cooperative Research Centre for Vaccine Technology and the World Health Organisation Collaborating Centre for Reference and Research on Influenza. And in 2015, most of you will know that she was appointed as the Chief Executive Officer of the National Health and Medical Research Council, or NHMRC. Anne's NHMRC leadership saw the reform of the agency's grant program, the establishment of the National Network for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Health Researchers, and the development of a regulatory framework to support the staged introduction of mitochondrial donation into clinical IVF practice. Huge and really important endeavours. During her tenure at NHMRC, Anne drove a major initiative to improve gender equality at the highest levels of health sector by setting targets for the award of grants to outstanding women in health and medical research. This initiative, which we're going to talk a little bit about, required extensive national consultation to find a way to really create a genuine gender equity at this leadership level. And I really see that this will provide the pathway for changes in practice within research organisations. Excitingly, Anne was awarded the Doctor of Medical Science honor Honoris Causa by the University of Melbourne last year. So Anne, welcome and thank you so much for taking time today to join me in conversation about your journey so far, I guess. 
Thanks very much, Natalie, and it's, it's wonderful to be here. Um, you've been very generous because I know we're in a room full of high-achieving people, so uh, I'm just uh, one of a very rich uh, group of people here today. Um, but I'm looking forward to our conversation. Fantastic. Well, I'd like to start thinking we're on the eve of International Women's Day and thinking about your professional career journey. How did you come to choose a career I guess in medicine, um, medical research and immunology, uh, particularly trying to think back to you as a, a young girl. What did you think about this career? Yeah. Well, what I knew was I didn't want to be a doctor. <laughs> so, um, so I didn't do medicine, I did science because I was really interested in medical science and particularly in bugs. I was really interested in viruses. Um, and you know, ended up doing a science degree here and majoring in microbiology. So I wanted to do a virology honours year with Ian Holmes, and some people might remember that Ian with Ruth Bishop um, discovered the rotavirus, and you know, it was a very exciting time. Um, but Ian wasn't taking students, so immunology was my second um, choice for honours, and then I just, you know, I loved it and I stayed in the field. Um, and I think it was a really interesting time to join um, the world of immunology. It's been fascinating. Uh, seeing the developments that have happened from what was you know, a pretty muddy field, very theoretical, uh, into something that's now profoundly important in the clinic as well. Uh, so, you know, I've enjoyed, I've enjoyed that aspect of my career a great deal. Yeah, and in thinking back to that time, I, I know that you got your PhD in 1980. You, I, I, can, can, I can probably already guess in immunology, was there many women role models around that you could look up to? Well, um, there were a few, but of course, most of the senior people that I was meeting at meetings or when I was here in the Department of Microbiology back in the day when it didn't even have immunology in its title. Yeah. Um, I mean, there were two senior uh, women or one very senior woman and one rising up through the ranks at the time in the department. Nancy Millis was the senior woman and she was fabulous and a wonderful um, support and mentor and Christina Cheers was the other and so I could see the path that it took for somebody to, I guess she was a lecturer at that time and then ultimately a professor. So there weren't all that many women around. Um, it was helpful to know that there were some. Yeah. Uh, I think the other thing that was a big help for me was that I came from a family where women had gone to university for a couple of generations and um, so you know I, I saw that as accessible. I think that's really important and mm. it's very different probably for people who are coming from uh, families where you're the first person going to university. Yeah. So yeah, a few advantages despite um, the nature of the times. Yeah, for yeah. sure. And, and I am someone who is first in family, mm. first generation, to even go to university, um, probably even to finish high school, but anyway, we'll talk about that another time. Um, and I, I, I agree that there was additional challenges and it's, it's really amazing that our, the university now is um, working towards widening the participation of students from different backgrounds. And I think it's going to be a really crucial part of work to make sure that we're, we're thinking about how to make sure that all bright minds can get here to study here. So it's fantastic. I want to touch base now next. I'm sure many in the room know you very well um, for your leadership at the NHMRC for eight years and did exceptional things. But I was particularly interested in, and again, a real fan of your work um, in 2022 and 2023, where you really made some bold leadership decisions around gender equity. Can you, for those who don't know in the room, can you talk about these incredible changes that you made? And importantly, what advice would you give to others wanting to shake things up a little bit and drive proactive change in their own areas? Yeah, thank you. Um, the problem we'd seen for, um, for years in NHMRC was if you looked at the people who were applying for fellowships, and NHMRC had a complex fellowship scheme, lots of different levels, lots of different types of fellowships. But if you looked at that over the years, you saw there were always lots of women coming in as applicants at the most junior level, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, then just the numbers dropping off, so that by the time you looked at the more senior pool of applicants, um, they were virtually all men. Mm -hmm. So you go from having a slight majority of women at the early career researcher stage to having routinely a ratio of four to one or even greater at the most senior yeah. level. So it's a classic scissor curve. Um, and so I became aware of that quite early in my time at NHMRC. 
Um, and uh, we didn't really know what to do about it at that stage. We didn't have enough really solid data to do anything. But we did see in the project grant scheme, which was huge, mm. that routinely, every year, the success rate was lower for women than for mm. men. So that's where we started. And what we did then in 2017-18 was start to have a special pot of money so that we would fund additional women below the initial funding cutoff to try to get to equal success rates for yeah. men and women in that scheme. So that was really well accepted. It was interesting. You know, people understood the reason. The data was really strong. Mm. It fitted the rules for a special measure under the Sex Discrimination Act. Um, but then we were still left with the scissor graph. And when we uh, reformed the grant program and we replaced all these complex fellowships with a single scheme, investigator grants with a fellowship plus a support package, five levels going from early career researcher through to senior professor. And what we saw was the same scissor graph. And it was now very obvious because we, you know, everything was pulled into a much simpler fellowship scheme. And the first three years, there was just no movement. Um, so again, this four to one ratio of men applying at the top yeah. level uh, and more women than men applying at the lower end. So at the early career end, women were doing perfectly well. They were applying in greater numbers. They were being very successful, but even though women at the senior end were being successful, there were hardly any of them, so yeah. you know, why aren't they not applying? Now, we could talk for an hour or so about the reasons <laughs> they don't apply, and I know that's I'll take what... you up on <laughs> <laughs> I know that's, um, that's what many people are thinking about yeah. and, and trying to tackle. Um, at NHMRC, the way to try to tackle that is the relative to opportunity policy. Yeah. So you ask peer reviewers to take somebody's background and history into account in um, scoring their grant application. And basically, you know, I think this is extremely hard. We yeah. made a whole lot of changes to that. We tried to expand the sort of information that people could provide if they wanted to make the case. Um, and it wasn't shifting that scissor graph. So that's when uh, I thought, well, it's time to get serious about this. So we did a lot of data analysis. Mm. We put out a big package of data where we'd really tried to pull apart the numbers um, early in 2022. And we had, I think we had a couple of national webinars about mm. that. Um, and then we set to work internally modeling, well, you know, what if you were really Bold. I mean, you could just say, have an extra pot of money for women across the board, um, and that's one way to go. But you could also be bold and say, um, just split the budget in two. There were people suggesting we do that, or just give equal numbers of grants to men and women. So we, so we modelled that, and then we put out a big paper that showed what would happen if you did that with the previous results. You know, what would have happened if we'd intervened in that way last year and the year before? Mm. And then we went around the country and talked about it. Some people might have come to the session here in Parkville. Um, we had meetings with um, senior people in institutions. We had a terrific meeting here somewhere else on this floor, um, maybe part of this room on this floor uh, for the Parkville crowd, and some of you might have been there. Um, and we um, had a Mentimeter sort of survey process that we ran during the presentations around the country. And uh, we also had an online survey. Um, so we were just trying to get as much of a response as we could. You know, it wasn't compulsory. It was just whoever wanted to say something could say something. It's very interesting how <laughs> few men said anything, but a lot of women had a lot to say, and, and that was very helpful. Um, and so then, really, we had the data. We had the feedback. We had uh, actually a surprising amount of support mm. from those who chose to participate. Um, in doing something like splitting the budget or awarding equal numbers of grants. So in the end, we needed to work that through with our research committee, with our council, with our Women in Health Science Committee and with the minister. The minister, when I said to him, we would like to award equal numbers of investigator grants to men and women, he gulped. Mm. And then he said, but I remember what we did in 1994 when we introduced quotas for women for pre-selection. Um, for Parliament, yes, and uh, it's taken time, but it worked. Um, and you know, you look at the difference in female representation in Parliament for the Labor Party compared with the Coalition, and it's dramatically different. So those are the sorts of things that give you courage, and actually, I think, meant the minister backed us in on that. Um, and so then, I was really delighted that the minister, with the Minister for Women, Katie Gallagher, announced that we would be doing that. 
um, in October in 2022. We didn't do it just take the whole um, scheme and um, split um, equal numbers of men and women for the lower end, the more junior end, I mm. should say, not the lower end, just the more junior end. The emerging but leaders. The emerging leaders, um, EL1 and EL2. We stuck with mm. um, awarding, uh, having a special budget to support extra women if needed, but s sometimes we don't need it. So they're doing perfectly well, they're there in numbers, they'll They'll, uh, they're off to a good start. What we need to do is provide opportunities and encouragement for them to keep moving into that scheme um, and not out of it. And so that's what I hope equal numbers of leadership level grants will achieve over time. Yeah, and I just re remember vividly watching this all unfold. And at the similar time, I was trying to move, make changes here in the Faculty um, of Medicine, Dentistry and Health Sciences and really watching your evidence-based approach as well as your consultation widely. Uh, I just have to say it was a huge role model um, for me and, and now we've done some really great modelling on what could be done if we were prepared to be bold. So we're going to share this story, um, you know, more broadly for, for those who don't know, but I think what an amazing, amazing achievement and really thinking it through as a scientist. So I think that's fantastic. Yeah. There was a second part to yeah. your question though and, and, what and advice I spent so would you long give? talking about the first yeah. part. Um, I think that when I think about what we did then, and, and in a sense we did something similar earlier when we reformed the grant program, which was mm. much earlier in my time at NHNRC, the first thing is to be really clear about the problem that you want to solve. Um, and uh, it's easy to be muddy about that, you know, we want more women in science. Um, so we needed to be quite specific about what we were trying to achieve and what the problem was, what the data was to back it. The second thing then I think is, um, if you're in a senior position or you're wanting to introduce changes, seek advice. Get as many voices into that discussion as you can because, you know, none of us has the answer. Um, I didn't know we were going to do this. Um, <laughs> I needed to be persuaded myself. Uh, and um, I think talking to lots of people really uh, understanding the impact on different people, different types of people was a very important Thing, and I think that's really useful in trying to address anything that's potentially controversial and potentially has winners and losers, so yeah, that's an issue. And then I think the third thing, the final thing that um, is a lesson for me is how important it is to have people part of that discussion and then on side and championing what you do. It's actually something that um, Greg Hunt, when he was my minister, um, gave me fantastic advice on back with the reform of the grant program. Was how important it was to have champions who would go out and um, and say that this was a good thing to do. Because yeah. you know that there will be people who don't like what you're doing. There's bound to be pushback, backlash. But to have some people at least standing up and saying, look, this is a good thing and we need to do it, it's extremely helpful and yeah. you're not on your own then. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. We need those champions of change that really want to see that change and, and understand why that, that change will have benefits for all if we get behind this common purpose. And I, I couldn't agree more. What well, great advice. Really think about what the problem is before you even start to seek how to fix it and really think about how the interventions might work and then the consultation with the people. And no doubt, I'm sure after it was all passed, you probably got lots of feedback, but... Um, Hopefully, um, those people realise that they could have had an opportunity earlier on in, in the actual process. Yeah. So, I live in Fitzroy. Yes. When Taylor Swift was at the <laughs> MCG, I couldn't really hear the music, but I could hear the crowd. Yeah. And it, when I was thinking about, you know, how do people respond when, when the ministers announced our intervention, it was a bit like that. Yeah. We got this kind of <laughs> roar of social media and people emailing and people stopping me in the street and saying thank you for doing that and um, and that was really lovely and, and very helpful. Of course there's something happening underneath of course. Um, which is not a roar of the crowd mm. um, but is equally important and uh, important to acknowledge that there are people who weren't happy, uh, probably are still not happy and uh, some have engaged with us or, uh, or possibly with NHMRC since, I don't know. Um, uh, but not everybody did. It's just a bit of a rumble underneath. Mm. And that's really important to remember that if we want to keep the change that we actually make in the first place, we've got to keep our eye on the prize. Um, we've got to make sure that we don't just think it's fixed now and then we can take our foot off and, and not worry. 
So that's fantastic. All right, I know I've been hogging Anne, but I'm going to ask her two really fast questions and then I'm going to open it up to the room. Anne, what's one pearl of wisdom that you'd like to leave with our guests? You've already given us so many, but if you can give us one more. Well, I think it's a, it's a version of my third point before probably, and that is, well, first of all, you know, be courageous, mm. uh, but don't do it on your own. Mm. Um, you've got to, if you're going to do something big that affects people, then you absolutely need to be sure you've got people around you who, um, who are telling you the truth, first of all, um, not always the people who work for you. Um, <laughs> and, um, uh, but then, yeah, you need champions to, to, to help you through and you need, you need a support network. Yeah, peer support and mm -hmm. champions for change. Fantastic. Yeah. All right, last question from me. You wake up tomorrow as boss of Australia, you're the Prime Minister. What's one thing you would do to enhance diversity, equity and inclusion? I would get the Treasurer into the Prime Minister's <laughs> office and I would say the next budget has free childcare. Oh, yes. All right, I'm voting for Anne. Don't know about you. And then I'd resign. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, love it, love it. All right, I, have, I know I've been hogging Anne and we have some mics that can roam to you. So you can just put your hand up and then we will come to you and you can ask Anne anything. And after this is over, you'll regret not asking. So now is the time. Here we go, we've got one here, fantastic. And please introduce yourself if that's okay. Yes, hello, I'm Julia Claycorn. I'm the manager of the STEM Outreach Programs in Science. Um, thank you so much for everything you said. Um, it's really inspiring and also you say it so articulately and so that it's just wonderful to hear. Um, my, my question was, I'm just interested with, um, you said you looked at, when you were um, looking at doing the 50%, 50-50, and you did a lot of modelling, what, what did you find in mm. terms of if we do start to do the 50-50, what, what are going to be the outcomes? Were there tangible outcomes? Was it more social impact outcomes? Yeah, what, what did you find? All we could really model is what would the grant results look like? Yeah. You know, what would be the outcomes? What percentage of women and men would be? Or, and, and I should have said we've included non-binary with women <laughs> in this, um, in this uh, initiative. Um, we would have seen how would the number of investigator grants awarded at each level to men and women um, have um, changed compared with what actually happened. So that doesn't ask the question of over time what would be the social impact of that. And it's really interesting to think what could be. I mean, one thing you'd hope is that it would encourage more women to apply. And I really hope over time that's what we'll see. We'll, we'll, the scissograph you would hope would gradually flatten uh, as more women move through the system, as more women have the courage to apply for these you know, pretty elite grants. Um, the other thing somebody said to me, which I thought was really interesting, is they said they hoped that now institutions would place as much value on recruiting senior women as they do on recruiting senior men. Now, that's a really interesting thing. You know, you think about when you recruit a senior person to somewhere like this university and you want somebody who's going to get big grants and, you know, build things around them, then realising that a woman can do that too <laughs> Uh, is very helpful. Mm. Uh, and um, so I thought that's another kind of social impact that I'd really hope to see down the track. It's not going to happen in the first year, but over time. Definitely. And I think part of the modelling was actually to show this whole argument that we have, have this meritocracy. We still need excellence. You can't just give grants away <laughs> to, to women who aren't excellent. And what Anne showed, which was compelling to me, was that every single one, if they just it funded equal, you still were only giving grants to outstanding or excellent candidates. So it actually, at the end of the day, the numbers are so bunched together, yeah. it didn't actually change the, the outcome of funding excellence. So I think it was really important. Yeah. We've got another question over here, Moira. Thanks, Anne. Uh, slightly complicated question. So uh, at, at universities, uh, Many people are hired on a education and research contract. Um, so they have a, a, a mix of teaching responsibilities and uh, research. We certainly see that um, expectations around education have a gender influence within them, meaning that there is less opportunity, less time for women to apply for fellowships like this. 
how, you know, now that you're, you, know, you can say whatever you like now, um, how, how would you recommend the NHMRC work with universities to level that playing field? Well, I think that what we tried to do already was broaden the way we ask for information for people's track record in their investigator grant application and other track record driven applications so that um, the, the peer reviewer would have a better picture of the overall load on this person uh, and their advantages and disadvantages, if you like, in building up research productivity. So I think a conversation about whether that's working for people who um, are carrying heavy teaching loads, um, are there ways to uh, address it? You know, anything to do with relative to opportunity is just so hard because each person's history is unique. And so how do you capture that? And then how does a peer reviewer who's, um, you know, you don't know what's going on in their head, um, how do they evaluate that information and then adjust their scores up or down according to that history? I think it's a hugely mm. difficult issue and it's that sort of overall systemic disadvantage of women across the board, not every woman, not every man, but you know, overall, that we were trying to adjust by by that initiative, mm. and that it's is the problem. it's really interesting thinking about a, a assessment relative to opportunity, yeah. and we just need to get really a lot more sophisticated about this because, again, the impact that mm. that person can have um, in society or or whichever their research field is is really important, and I think. That's true. We need, we're doing it in promotions as well. We need to make sure that this is fundamentally an, a clear and important thing that we're asking peer reviewers to do. Yeah. And I think that is just fundamentally hard because NHMRC is giving grants to do research. People are going to evaluate the, the application through that lens. They're not thinking about the broader social mm. benefits of having uh, you know, a diverse workforce or um, having people who are teaching as well as doing research or doing clinics as well as doing research. Yeah. All of these... Yeah things that get in the way of full-time research intensive activity are, are very difficult to evaluate. They are, they are high value to the community, but they won't necessarily be perceived that way by a peer reviewer. Mm. Absolutely. So. All right, we have time for one last question. And this room, you, this side of the room hasn't asked a question. We've got one just up the front <laughs> here. Hands. In fact, we've got time for two more. And I saw a hand up the back. <laughs> Uh, I'm Tina Brock from the Collaborative Practice Center. Thank you so much. Um, this was absolutely the second best way I could spend two hours today in, in this amazing room and listen <laughs> to this. The first was I did have a deep hope that this was a shadow activity. We're all going to come up here. They're going to turn off the lights and say, you get two hours for a nap. <laughs> you don't tell anyone. You get to count it. You know. um, but I, I love the strategies of, you know, making the research pie bigger, apportioning the pieces, perhaps more equitably, and I wonder if you had some advice about how to make sure that the women aren't the only people that are always buying the ingredients to make that pie. And that goes back to the comment about the administrative time and your last comment about the things that are very important to the community and all the systems, the 16 plus systems that we have to work with on a daily basis just to do our jobs, putting in the same information repeatedly. Um, any advice about how we can streamline some of that? Mm. Well, I'm sure there are things at the bureaucratic end of, it, of grant applications that can be done to keep streamlining. So everybody tries to do that with not enough money. Um, so you know, I'd love I'd loved us to have been able to simplify the grant application process, but I'm afraid we didn't get to it in my time. But maybe Steve Wessling as the uh, will. Uh, but I did also hear Moira make the point of having time to sit on the diversity and inclusion committee. Um, and we, we asked the people who have the problem to go and sort it out for the university or the institute or the organisation. And uh, that, I know that's a, an issue for people. So there's a lot of, uh, I guess, awareness that institutions could perhaps bring to this to make sure that these um, activities aren't all falling on the same few people um, and uh, you're not expected to, 
to fix the system entirely mm. simply because you're a woman. And I think that's, you know, it's a bit like the experience with our consultation that was mostly, mostly women who turned up because they were interested. Yeah. Um, and the, there were senior men who turned up because they knew they'd better. Um, <laughs> and some of them were interested too, yeah. but um, yep. for sure <laughs> they knew they'd better. Mike, he was yeah, very, I was thinking very of Mike. interested. Yeah, I was thinking of Mike. Um, but uh, yeah, just to be yeah. just to be aware of how this load falls differentially mm. and unevenly across the sector. Yeah, and one thing I think I'm really proud of that the university has done now is looking at the ac academic career benchmark index for promotion, and actually valuing those what we traditionally wouldn't have thought as as promotable tasks. So that really now that under the leadership section, the new ACB shows that you can put these things, the, all these extra committees, all these nurturing and mentoring and support roles for leading the next generation. And it's a huge part of our new people strategy. So I'm really excited to see how that is going to have an impact on actually valuing our people for the extra contributions. So I think it's a huge, huge start and, and I, I look forward to seeing what that impact will be. So well done to all of the people who worked on that. Um, and particularly, I know Nicola's here in the audience, the provost, and that was work that Pip and Nicola and others have really championed, so it's fantastic. All right, we have one last question up the back. I think Jala had her hand up, and then I'll draw this to a close. Thanks, Natalie. Thanks, Anne. Congratulations on a big structural reform for a big structural point of disadvantage. Um, you touched briefly on the merit argument. Um, and I know that lots of people in this room in various roles and, and, and things that they're involved in will encounter this. I guess my question was, did at any point anyone say to you, oh, this is a nice idea, but you just really can't do this? And how, what advice would you give people in this room about how to kind of unpack the merit argument so that pursuit of the removal of barriers can be a success. Mm. Yeah, well, I think it's a hugely important issue, and, and Natalie referred before to the fact that the scores on grants are all bunched up, so you're actually working in a very piled up, um, dense part of the curve, uh, and so um, uh, the, the merit argument almost falls away because these are indistinguishable scores from a, almost from a statistical point of view. But that doesn't really, that only partly addresses the issue. I think what's really important here is to acknowledge and try to find the words to say that this is a modest adjustment for structural disadvantage that has meant people's true merit has not been fully valued. Um, but to find the way to say that that is compelling to somebody who says, well, you know, you're just throwing excellence out the window, which is what plenty of people did say to us. You know, NHMRC used to be all about excellence and now it's not, now it's about gender. And um, if, if there, well, perhaps I, could, <laughs> I don't want to go on too long, no, but there's fine. one thing that was really interesting when you think about the modelling for what we did. Um, if we had had equal numbers of grants to men and women at the highest level, instead of the whole group of leadership fellows, but just at the highest level, we would have had an 80% success rate for, for women and something like a 5% success rate for men. You can't do that. So we designed it to do things in a different way. Um, but that will be a case where you'd say that that is going to give you people a genuine difference in, in merit. But what we're in fact doing, because of the way we set it up, was it's a very minor difference in merit as assessed by peer review score. <coughs> and it's a minor adjustment for structural disadvantage. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Anne. Thank you for all of your leadership um, throughout your career today. And thank you for joining us today on the eve of International Women's Day. I know you're very busy, um, but we've, absolute <laughs> like we've absolutely loved just hearing your wisdom. And I know there's many in this room who are ready to keep being the change agent agents and the champions for change. So thank you for being one of those and, and walking us through how you did that. Thanks. <laughs>
but also the amazing um, faculty of Indigenous women that we have across the university and our professional staff as well. So I'm delighted that we're doing this as a cross-faculty initiative. You know, we're one university. I think it's quite amusing that we even celebrate that we're doing a cross-faculty initiative. But um, there will come the time when we don't even call it out. So um, it's great to be here today with Deans of Science and Engineering and IT to celebrate International Women's Day. Um, and I really um, hope that everybody in this room is taking the time to reflect on the amazing women that have helped them get to this point in their lives. And I'm sure as you reflect on that, many um, wonderful people will come into your, into your minds. Um, it was great to listen to Anne Kelso and Natalie Hannon. Thank you. I'd like you all to join together again and give them another round of applause. Um, it was really wonderful. And I think, Anne, you managed to get through a panel where someone didn't ask you where the panels were coming back. So well done, well done. <laughs> I was just waiting for that question um, and it didn't happen. So uh, there you are, we have moved on. Both women, incredible researchers, wonderful to work with both uh, Natalie as our Associate Dean Diversity and Inclusion and it's been wonderful experience with Anne um, on NHMRC Council um, to have seen her in her role of CEO of the NHMRC and to realise just how, um, what an amazing job that you did in that role, Anne. Uh, and how one of the things that you didn't say in the panel, but there was a lot of negativity during that time, even from women. And I saw Anne have to take all of that um, and couldn't just go out telling everybody what might happen and everyone had to be very, you know, careful about what was said at that time. And you really did weather a lot of, um, a lot of difficulty, Anne. So I think that I want to just uh, actually acknowledge that because um, some of it may have even come from women in Parkville. You never know. I'm a, <laughs> you never know. <laughs> um, but it was, was a wonderful thing. So today we're going to highlight the successes and challenges for women in science, technology, engineering, maths and medicine. And I want to see a show of hands for how many people have read the book Taking to the Field by Jane Carey. Okay, that is your homework. <laughs> I will not do any spoilers because that book will actually change your mind about how you think about women in science in Australia. I will say no more, but I don't know if the two people who've read it would agree with me, but there's some surprises in that book. Um, it was given to me by my son, which makes it even more, more special. Um, so I highlight that one for you. So you've been uh, collaborating and networking and having wonderful conversation. Um, Moira talked about the time that we need and it was great to hear um, you know, the, the question about whether or not we were here for a nap. The only <laughs> time you didn't mention, Moira, was whether we got time to go to the toilet because <laughs> that's a common problem for w women, I've noticed, <laughs> time to go to the toilet. Um, so there you go. We've, we've uh, all looking for more time. Today we're going to be wowed by a panel that will be moderated by Professor Elaine Wong. And Elaine is Pro Vice Chancellor of People and Equity and a Professor of Electrical Engineering in FATE. And Elaine's research is really focused on something that we all need, the 6G internet, improved wireless and wearable monitoring devices for humans, as well as many other things, I'm sure, Elaine. And this is going to give us much better coverage and bandwidth for wireless internet. The question whether or not this is going to give us more time, I don't know. Maybe that will come up. But it's wonderful work and something that Elaine is passionate about, removing barriers for women to enter the STEM fields. And she's been an author of an article titled Affirmative Recruitment of Women in STEM, a case study looking at the strategy from the Faculty of Science, in which only women were allowed to apply for academic positions. And Elaine's work showed that only one round of affirmative action recruitment led to a much greater feeling of um, optimism amongst prospective applicants when a university is committed to gender. And um, I'm sure that we'll hear more um, about that in her questions today. Elaine is um, recently in her role, so it's wonderful to have you uh, facilitating today, Elaine, and it's wonderful to have you join the leadership of the university tackling this really challenging um, issue around gender equity and diversity. So thank you. Let's welcome our panel. Thank you. Thank you very much.
much, Jane, for that kind introduction. Um, I'd like to add um, that um, my co-authors on the article um, is uh, Professor Marilis Gilliman as well as Georgina Fletcher. I just like to call that out. <laughs> okay, so it's my pleasure, absolute pleasure, uh, to moderate um, the panel discussion this afternoon. Uh, I'm joined today by an impressive lineup of colleagues uh, who have very generously given up their time uh, to share their unique experiences, their observations, their insights, as well as advocacy uh, in equity and diversity in the STEM field. So on the panel, uh, we have, I'll start on at the far end, Associate Professor uh, Jenny Waycott, a Deputy Head of School Research in the Faculty of Engineering and Information Technology, School of Computer and Information Systems. Uh, Jenny leads the Design for Aging Research theme in the Human Computer Interaction Research Group. Jenny is a recent ARC Future Fellow, and her research examines how older adults and aged care providers can use technologies for social and emotional well-being. Welcome, Jenny. Thank you. And we have Angkor Singh, Dr. Angkor Singh next to me. Uh, he is Australian Research Council DECRA Senior Research Fellow with joint appointments between the Melbourne School of Population and Global Health and Melbourne Dental School. His research contributions are in the area of population oral health, tobacco control, and social determinants of health. And he applies a range of quantitative skills to quantify the impact of policy interventions on health inequities. So welcome, Angkor. And last but definitely not least, uh, it's my pleasure to welcome Professor Rachel Webster. Professor Webster is Redmond Berry Distinguished Professor in the School of Physics. Uh, she has a stellar career teaching and researching astrophysics, astronomy, for over 20 years. Her work has been internationally <laughs> 30 years. Her work has been internationally recognized. Uh, she has also, or she was also, the inaugural AIP Women in Physics lecturer. She has a continuing commitment to equity and diversity in science. Now, in 2020, uh, Professor Webster received an Officer of the Order of Australia for a distinguished service to education in the field of astrophysics and astronomical research, and for her dedication to young women scientists. Welcome, Rachel. So Rachel, I'd like to kick off today's discussion with you. Um, can you tell us a bit about your background, specifically what led you to a career choice in STEM? Well, oh, well thank you very much, Elaine. Um, and really for me it was very easy because uh, even in secondary school I was very passionate about science and mathematics. And that really crystallised around astronomy and astrophysics. And, you know, I've been extremely lucky because over the course of my career, I think you would say it's been a golden age for astronomy and astrophysics. You know, it's just completely blossomed. And so I've had the good luck to be on the, on the front of that wave. And, you know, astro is something that really speaks to everyone. But in particular, I believe it speaks to young young people, um, young women in particular, uh, and it's an entry into the physical sciences, the power of the physical sciences and, and what you can do to understand the world. So, so it sort of has come together in my, in my career, I think, in a very positive way. And it's very so. fascinating. And we will come back to, to that later on. We'll unpack a little bit about that. So Jenny, can I then um, throw the same question to you? What led you to a career in uh, STEM? <laughs> Thanks, Elaine. My answer is a bit more complicated because I did not know I would have a career in STEM. I certainly wasn't, um, you know, heading down that path as a high school student. Um, if I think back to, I think, 31 years ago, I would have been on the eve of turning 18 and um, would have been in the end of perhaps second year, of, second week of first year uni where I was here doing a Bachelor of Arts. Um, and I was tossing up whether to major in psychology or English literature. And if someone had said to me then that in 30 years' time you'll be working in the Faculty of Engineering and IT in the <laughs> School of Computing and Information Systems, I would have said, don't be ridiculous. That's just not possible. <laughs> so I've kind of fallen into this, um, into the, the STEM discipline um, through a fairly circuitous route. I was interested in um, people. And so I, I ended up doing... Uh, research, starting my research career in psychology. And um, through that path, I, I discovered that there was this field of research called human-computer interaction, which brings together, you know, people and technology. And, 
and that's there. Yeah, that's where I've ended up working. And I, I really value being able to do um, research that has a potentially, you know, social impact because it does involve designing and using technology that improves people's lives. Yeah. That's fantastic. Let's bring you into the conversation, Ankle. What about you? What led you to a career in um, STEM? Um, so I grew up in India, uh, and that's where I did my undergraduate degree in dentistry. But Every day, I mean, if you if you want to learn about social determinants of health, you just need to take a walk in Delhi, and in all corners of Delhi, you'll understand it. But I didn't have a theory for it. Uh, so that's where uh, I did my master's in dental public health. I was very lucky uh, to do it in UCL in London, and where I really got a sort of a deeper understanding about how these social determinants sort of play in, in generating both our health, but also inequalities in health uh, across societies. And since then, I'm just chasing that. I uh, uh, moved to Australia, looking at uh, applying the things that I learned theoretically and methodologically uh, in the field of oral health, tobacco control, and, and beyond. Okay, fantastic. And we'll come back to that when we talk about alleviating inequities. So Jenny, I want to throw the next question to you. Um, you know, today is about, today and tomorrow is about, and it should be every day of the year, <laughs> it's about acknowledging recognizing and celebrating women um, in STEM. So is there someone that you know of um, that has had insufficient recognition, female scientists, for example? Um, yeah, so when I thought about this question, there's, there's been, uh, there's a, there are a number of people I want to, you know, shout out to. Firstly, I benefit from working with and collaborating with some amazing women. So, you know, some of them are in this room and, um, I think they all deserve recognition. Um, but I'm also, I, I was telling you before at lunch that I, I'm inspired by the stories of women in previous generations who didn't have the same opportunities that we have now and who were able to, you know, break down barriers. And I do have a personal story of someone in that category. So my mother-in-law's mother, she was, a, she was exactly 60 years older than me, so we shared a birthday. Um, and she was... In the 1930s, she was a student here at the University of Melbourne doing medicine, and she went on to become a GP and to work in rural Tasmania while raising four children, living on a farm in Tasmania. And so I think stories like that, you don't hear about them, they're not, they're not well known, but they're really, really inspiring because you know that she may have had more opportunities um, for education than other women of her generation, but she still would have been really facing those barriers that, that um, would have been much stronger then. Yeah. 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 You know, we must uh, tell these stories, you know, and carry on for further generations. So what about you, Ankur? Do you have someone that you have, you know, in mind that inspires you? Um, plenty. First of all, there are lots of people here as well who have supported me, uh, uh, who are really inspiring in day-to-day -day life. Um, I'm really lucky also to walk in a school, Melbourne School of Population and Global Health every day, where led by you know, the head of school, uh, who is an amazing woman, and had supervisors, uh, always women, who have contributed to my career where I am. Uh, one person definitely comes to my mind, who is Nancy Krieger, a professor who established uh, the pathways through which racial discriminations impact health. And I think that work is quite instrumental in US and beyond to understand how some of the discrimination uh, uh, actually, you know, leads to poor health outcomes in people and for the whole population. So if I can, maybe I can go to the next question. Uh, Rachel, I'll bring you into the conversation. Um, you've had a decorated and stellar career in you know, astronomy research. And uh, this is me assuming that you've had challenges. Maybe you haven't. Um, <laughs> can you tell us <laughs> some of the challenges that you know, you've faced, or perhaps still facing, that continuously undermines your, your contributions to the field? <laughs> Yeah, well, look, when I was thinking about this, I mean, really, I think the hardest thing, um, and this was particularly true probably in the first 20 years or so of my research career, was, um, you, you know, inevitably I was working main, mainly with men um, because that's the field, um, and it was always assumed uh, that they were the leaders of the scientific, you know, innovation, if you like, um, that was going on. And... I mean, not 100%, but a lot of the time it was me, and that was extremely frustrating. Um, I will say, 
I don't think it's a problem for me now, but that's probably because I'm quite senior now, but I still see it with young women where, you know, the automatic assumption is that, you know, they start with, it's the guy who's driving the thinking, the strategic directions of a piece of research, and not necessarily recognising where, you know, attributing uh, where the ideas are coming from. So I, I think that's the thing that I've found hardest over my career. So, so what happens if you witness, you know, um, such a thing? What, what would, what would you advise, you know, allies to, well, to do? Well, uh, you know, certainly as far as I'm concerned, I, I think I've developed a very thick skin. You know, it's not something I get um, upset about anymore. I just, well, I'm, you know, just smile and grin and bear it. But. I do try and call it out, and I too do try, particularly amongst my younger colleagues, to put, you know, to make sure that their ideas are being recognised and to, to, you know, let people understand that this is where the ideas are coming from. These are the people who are driving the thinking of what's going on here, um, and and so it's just being able to sit back now and be conscious um, of those those biases that are, are pretty pervasive. Mm, yeah, that is to use your agency, yeah, to Indeed. ensure that it's. Indeed. Angkor, talking about ally, you definitely are an ally. You work very closely with female colleagues. I'd like to understand from your lens what you see are the challenges that your colleagues face. I, I, I think, um, so obviously through my own journey, I've, I've realized over time and, and being a parent right now for two young children, two and uh, five years old, I've seen it through how challenging this period can be for if if you if you don't take time off to support, and I I I think that that period of particularly for uh, for uh, you know young researchers who are parents is is really difficult period, and if you don't get support at that time, I think that is a critical issue. Um, and I think that support needs to be created systemically, but also at a very team level, at a supervisory level, where you just need to understand and look at a person beyond the work to be done. It has to be a holistic approach to their life, their profession, and their sustainable um, career. You know, So I think uh, I really feel that that's a very important point in time, where particularly I've seen my women colleagues uh, definitely suffer much more than men. Um, and I also feel like perhaps creating opportunities for men to actually alleviate that pressure in this time is absolutely critical because otherwise the, the old gender roles and the attitudes keep reinforced again and again. So I, I feel like that is a really crucial period where support is needed. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Angkor. Jenny, what about you? Do you have anything to add? With yeah, um, just building on what Angkor said, um, I, you know, I, I had a very long postdoctoral period because I started my family at the same time that I started my career. So I returned to Melbourne um, with a, after finishing my PhD with a two-year-old and a baby on the way and another one that would come later. <laughs> um, and it, my goal at that time was really to just keep my foot in the door in the academic world. And I was able to do that through a series of part-time, fixed-term, sometimes casual contracts. So it was very precarious. But my concern is now, you know, and I was able to survive. So I was, you know, I was really pleased that I maintained a career. Um, but my concern is now that I think that's more difficult. So I'm talking 20 years ago, and I look at my colleagues now who've got young children, and they all work full-time or almost full-time. They're all, you know, trying to do everything, and I just worry that the goalposts have moved to the point where it's hard, much harder to kind of maintain a foot in the door while your priorities are elsewhere, and, and then to come back to that career. And I think it's, yeah, I think, I think it's a, a worrying, uh, worrying time, yeah. That's a great segue to my next question then. So this year's, you know, International Women's Day theme is counter in, invest in women, accelerate their progress. And so, Rachel, you helped co-create the Women in Physics program 30 years ago, you corrected me um, during lunch, um, ensuring that women that came through physics thrived and were successful. 
Now the program helped, and we talked about you know a lot about evidence um, before in the in the interview. Um, here, the proof is in the pudding. It actually did help increase the number of women graduating in physics at the university. So, what was it about this program in particular that made it successful? Yeah. Um, well. As Elaine said, it's, it's our 30 year anniversary this year and we're quite excited about that. We're going to, I think, have a luncheon down at Queenscliff and invite as many of the people who, uh, as we can to come down and join us. Um, but look, the, and, and I should say, even though th there have been years when it has been extraordinarily successful, we did have one year where there was 50-50 in our honours year in physics, which if any of you know about physics, that's pretty unusual. Um, but uh, but we have seen a huge drop off in the number of women in physics, particularly through the COVID period. So, so, so I think, you know, a lot of the gains that we, we thought we'd made have, have actually slipped away with people, I, I think, sort of drawing back and thinking it's all too difficult and, and physics is generally viewed as difficult and, and so, so the numbers have dropped again. But let me return to the original question, which was why is it successful? And the reason is because w w in that program, we, we basically looked at the whole person. And so our discussion wasn't so much about physics. It was about, it was about your life, where you wanted to go, what were the barriers that you might face, you know, how could you have a family and, and, and be successful in physics. And, and by, by putting all of that, and, and this was 30 years ago, putting all of that out on the table, I think it made... It, it wasn't a more tractable problem, but it was at least a problem that was acknowledged and, and therefore, you know, it, it, it enabled people to actually think about how they might go about solving these parts of the problem. And I was just mentioning to Elaine, I mean, there are, obviously over 30 years, there are lots and lots of stories, but one I'll mention because, you know, well, it, it, I'm sure you'll enjoy it, is... So this was almost 30 years ago. We had a, a group of young women doing honours, and I remember one young woman just saying, oh, look, you know, I'm really not very good. I don't think I'll go on. Uh, and this is the glass half empty, glass half full that we see so often with women, I think. Anyway, we did say, look, you're as good as the next bloke. <laughs> you know, please go on. She did go on and do a PhD, and she is now the chief scientist at Swinburne University. So, you know, it does work and, you know, just by providing, and, and I think of this in a mentoring sense, um, if I can just take a few more moments. Sometimes we think of mentoring coming down from the top and sort of setting metrics, you know, trying to draw people up because we know where they want to go. And I think what we learn through that process is it's, you, you, we don't know where they want to go. It's about coming down to where they are and understanding where they want to go and, and, and what fits with, with their aspirations and, and indeed their abilities and their constraints, their families, you know, all the rest of it. And so it's, it's providing the support in that very holistic way. Yeah. Thank you very much. Very sage advice and very sage comments there. Jenny, would you say mentorship and perhaps sponsorship you know, uh, played a big part in where you are today? Yeah, definitely. And I think I think sponsorship in particular is really valuable. And, and you know, when, when we have people who are putting us forward for opportunities, like the example you just gave, you know, people really um, helping us, helping women see what they might not see themselves, um, and, and and you know, really encouraging uh, women to 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 take risks and to try out, you know, or to just be invited to be part of a part of a project team and so on. So that's been really, really valuable. The other thing that I would say is um, I've benefited a lot from peer mentorship. So really having um, groups of, of peers, colleagues, men and women who, you know, can provide support and, and just, you know, help you along the journey. And I've got a number of different kind of networks that sort of fill different roles in that respect. And, and it's been really valuable. One of them is actually the, the Academic Women in Leadership Group. So I did that program in 2020, 2021. And we, you know, we stay, stay in contact. I was saying to Victoria before at lunch that um, our group is actually getting together now to celebrate one member's achievement because she got an industry fellowship last week. And so that's just fantastic to have um, 
other women that you can celebrate each other's successes with. Tribes are very important. Yes. Yes. So I, I was just going to say, and I think Elaine will say this too, that the Women in Leadership program is fantastic. I did it in 2000. Wow. <laughs> and the, uh, the women that I went through with, we were all, I think, level C at the time. We all ended up as professors and in very senior leadership roles in the university. So it works. Yeah, uh, it's very, very good. I benefited greatly from that investment that the university made you know, to our careers, mm. definitely. Great, let's talk about, um, I want to go back to what you said, um, Jenny, about this moving goalpost. Mm -hmm. And I, I feel sometimes it is um, the lack of awareness in the decision makers, whether it is your line manager, whether it's your recruiter, uh, or the recruiting manager, not being aware of the pressures. You know, your uncle was saying the parroting pre pressures or the pressures of, you know, short-term contracts. So. Part of the word invest in the theme, and it goes back to, you know, Moira's um, sentiment about having time to yourself, you know, to re recharge. But also for me, that, that investment in time is the time that decision makers need to make to understand the experiences that underrepresented groups go through and the multi-layer disadvantages. And so if I can, you know, sort of unpack that, Jenny, in STEM, in the STEM field in particular, what are some of the gender stereotypes? So we're talking about awareness here, you know, um, that are you know specifically amplified in our in our field. Yeah, I'm going to have to think a little bit about that question. So, um, I mean, I guess I feel like I embody one of the stereotypes, which is that I work in you know, human-computer interaction. I work on the human side of technology, and that's that's an obvious stereotype that, we, that women are going to be more likely to to do the sort of soft sciences. And um, I don't know how that plays out um, in the sense of whether people, you know, because I, I personally feel like I'm, I'm getting opportunities. Um, so I don't feel like that limits me, but I guess uh, the... the the other challenges are just in terms of, you know, when we talk about the goalposts, it's in terms of assumptions about what you're going to be producing, how many grant, how many PhD students you supervise. That was something that I had a huge gap in my in my um, CV when I came to be applying for um, full-time roles. Is I just did not have PhD supervisions because I had been working in those those. Um, part-time fixed-term research fellow contracts and I just didn't get those opportunities and I think making sure people are aware that you know you said the whole the whole person before you know the whole person might mean there are strengths in some areas and there are gaps in other areas but it's not because they're not they don't have capacity and they're not brilliant people it's it's because of opportunity. Um, and I think there is, yeah, there's possibly a stereotype that assumes people all have similar opportunities. Yeah, that's yeah. right. And I, I know, Jenny, you do a lot of heavy lifting with regards to pastoral care and, and teaching as well. Mm, yeah. That's right. OK, so, Ankara, I want to bring you into the conversation. And um, you work in um, the area of health and, in particular, you know, sort of uh, policies with regards to or the impact of health inequalities. Um, so in your research, what are some of the investments that are currently being made or could be made to alleviate these inequalities? When one thing is quite topical, we, we uh, basically inequality is not just bad for the group which is disadvantaged, it's bad for everyone. <laughs> That's the thing. And one thing is quite topical, the income tax, right? Now there's discussions about that, that you know, we, we're moving from progressive taxation to something which would in increase inequalities. And these things intersect with other things, right? So we were speaking this morning about gender inequalities and how that ties in with income inequality. Um, coming from India, again, thinking, you know, the gender norms are very cultural. And perhaps a blanket policy would not help everyone because you really need to understand what's happening inside that home. It's not just when people turn up uh, at work. So again, just thinking about the gender norms, gender views that differ culturally, and understanding that, because research actually shows that egalitarian gender attitudes are good for everyone, again, mental health boys and girls rather than a particular. So I think just thinking through 
what can make it more egalitarian environment, more generally, and perhaps bringing up, uh, you know, children. I mean, one of the things that we do in the faculty is a leadership course for the co uh, early career cohorts. And to be honest, I can guarantee a cohort of 25 good leaders every year come out of that who know how to manage up, who know how to manage their time. They don't put unnecessary pressure on people. And I think the more we bring those cohorts up from that to the leadership, over time, I'm pretty sure uh, some of these issues will be addressed. Fantastic. We'll have to talk about that leadership course later. <laughs> Right, so unfortunately, we are almost at the end of our panel session. Um, I get to have one final question, yeah? Um, and then we'll throw it out to the audience. Um, so I hope you all agree that, you know, a career in STEM, at least for me, has been a, a very rewarding career, you know. Um, I remember the first time I came back from uh, maternity leave, you know, I was literally skipping into uh, my, my office. <laughs> Uh, I was that excited. Um, he's lovely, by, by the way. So, <laughs> uh, so what has been some of the, I mean, we talk about challenges and we talk about, you know, some of the solutions, but what has been some of the highlights for you? You know, we want to sort of inspire the next generation, right? So, I mean, would you like to share some of the things that, you know, has um, been, been the highlight of your career? I can go first if you yeah, if okay, you have more time to think. <laughs> um, I was on a panel recently where a similar question was asked. Yeah. <laughs> um, look, I um, I think I sort of had a career shift at one point because I was working in educational technology and then I moved into the human computer interaction group where I am now to work on a project with Frank who's just sitting over there looking at um, uh, technologies to support older people um, who are experiencing social isolation and that was a real turning point for me and quite a highlight because it, it has, it's the area I now work in, you know, 12 years later, it, it really enabled me to see um, the value of doing research um, on the benefits of tech, using technology for social benefit and so I've just, I've got a lot of um, uh, re career rewards from that, that career shift and yeah that that's been a real highlight for me Fantastic. Yeah. the translation of innovation and you can yeah. see that through every yeah what's this one? Mm. uh rachel would you like to go next <laughs> yeah sure oh look the the research I do is still, I find, incredibly exciting. I, I mean, I, I work on black holes, so um, <laughs> you may have seen there was something in the, in the uh, media in the last couple of weeks, and, you know, that was the group that I work with. So, you know, it, it, we, we can make good stories for the, for the media. But more importantly, um, the, thing that I, the thing that I find really inspirational here is the sort of science we do, I think, can draw particularly young women in. We, we can teach them, we teach them about data, we teach them about computing, we teach them about how the world works, the physics of the world works, and even a bit of chemistry and biology as well. And then, you know, a lot of, a lot of them, or some of them do go on and become astros, but, you know, we've, I've got students who are um, at the top of bioinformatics now because they've taken those skills to do something else. Meteorology, you know, um, robotics, you know, I mean, they, they can take those skills anywhere. And, and I, think, I think just being able to open up um, those very fundamental skills that you can apply to understanding how the world works is, is, is just, you know, a very powerful thing. Fantastic. Angkor, I'm, I'm the last a word. <laughs> I'm a quantitative researcher, but I love stories. <laughs> um, and, and due to a collaboration that happened, and this is a key feature of my research, uh, I had to go up recently to um, I, I, Rockhampton in Queensland. And I had an opportunity to uh, you know, interview a migrant, a Sri Lankan uh, refugee, who'd spent 10 years over here uh, and without any support except for just community support. And stories like that, you know, with the real life impact of our work and how we work with our partners, honestly, it's, it's just, um, it, those are much better parts than the academic side of things. Yeah. <laughs> Innovation for society, I totally agree. So now um, we are opening up um, the panel for questions from the floor. Would anyone like to ask our esteemed panel any questions? And I think I'm just looking at, yeah, do we have one, uh, one maybe one quick question? 
Anyone from any side right of the room? <laughs> oh yes, the one over here, okay. Pip Nicholson, DBC, People and Community. Rachel, actually for you, and I don't want to take the conversation away from the optimism and, and the generosity of the sharing, but you did point out that you're looking at a challenge that's resurfaced that you thought you'd addressed, and that was the declining number of women in your honours programs, the most particular focal point. With the resumption of that challenge, is it the same strategies that come back into play, or is it new ones? Actually, that's a really interesting question, Pip, and I, and I, I don't actually know the answer to that yet, um, because we're still coming to grips, I think, with exactly what we're dealing with. So, so of course, you know, kids come into the university at the bottom end, and it's, it's, it's where they, they step off and where they start uh, their journey, which is tending to be much more on the sort of people side of things, I would say. Um, which is, which is good, um, but we obviously don't want to lose them out of the, the physical and mathematical sciences as well. Um, I think the next couple of years we'll, we'll sort of be feeling our way through that problem, but I don't, I don't have a glib answer. I, all, all I've got at the moment is just data, um, and, I, and I wanted to say I thought I was really inspired by how and took data and worked with it in such a positive way, because I'm a very strong believer that the data gives you your jumping off point and and from there, you know, as good scientists, we can draw the right conclusions and then start to move forward. But I, I don't actually know the answer yet. I just know it's a problem. Uh, again, for Rachel, it is my Greta Kuiper. I'm from Electrical Engineering. Thank you, Rachel, and everyone else on the panel for this uh, really interesting discussion. Um, my question is uh, related to your uh, little story, so no, no data, just a little story, uh, Rachel, about the uh, honor student who thought that uh, she wasn't good enough for the, for the studies. What do you think is the reason that mostly women think that they are not good enough? What, what is behind it? And what can be done about that? Uh, so, so I'll start by making the observation that almost, I think, uniformly, the women that I've seen in physics, it is the glass half empty. You know, they're, they're much more conscious of what they can't do rather than what they can do. And I will say that the guys don't have the same problem. Um, <laughs> they usually, uh, not always, but often overestimate just how good they are. Um, so, so I, I, I think that I think it's unusual for women to actually have a high opinion of themselves. Um, I think I think they do they do see their shortcomings much more readily than they see their strengths. And I, and I even, uh, you know, I'm talking about students now, but I certainly see that amongst my colleagues as well. And, and it's quite well known that in promotions, um, you know, women will go for a promotion when they get to the 95 percentile point, and they're pretty sure to get through. And I've seen plenty of my colleagues, male colleagues, going at the 60 percent level. And, very often they get through as well. So, so it's just a very different attitude to, you know, evaluating where you're, where you're up to. Um, and, and, and the only way that I've seen around that is to encourage people to step forward a little bit sooner than they would, would naturally do, um, or even a lot sooner in some circumstances. I mean, um, you know, there, there are women I'm still talking to who are actually quite senior who don't think they're good enough well, even let's take an example to go into the Academy of Science, and you know I'm sitting there saying, actually, you're you're well over the line. You know, let's put you forward and and see what happens. So so it, it it doesn't just happen at the very you know junior levels. I think it happens all the way through most women's careers. I I can't recall having seen a a woman scientist who thought she was su superlatively good, and and you know, and she wasn't. <laughs> um, I, I won't say what the corollary of that is. <laughs> <laughs> okay, with that.
that, I did promise Rachel today that we will end at 2.15 because you will need to walk all the way back to physics for your 2.30 <laughs> class. And so with that, can you please help me uh, thank the panelists once again. And now I'd like to call on Professor Shanika Karunasekara, Deputy Dean of the Faculty of Engineering and IT. Thank you. For her closing remarks. Good afternoon, and thank you for taking the time to be us at our Celebrating Women in STEM lunch. Today's event has been nothing short of inspiring, and I feel honored to share some closing remarks with you. Before we proceed, I would like to extend my gratitude to our co-host, MBHS Dean, Professor Jane Gunn, uh, Faculty of Science Dean, Professor Mar Ma Moira O'Brien, and FGIT Acting Dean, Professor Frank Vettery. <laughs> your commitment to advancing diversity and inclusion in your respective faculties has been instrumental in making today's event a resounding success. I also want to extend my sincere appreciation to our panel moderator, Professor Elaine Wong, Pro Vice Chancellor for People and Equity. Your leadership in fostering inclusivity in the university is commendable, and your guidance during today's discussion has been invaluable. A special thank you to our spe guest speaker, Professor Ann Kessel, and Professor Natalie Hanan from NDHS. I was particularly enlightened to hear the bold initiatives you have taken to improve the gender equality in the NHMRC during your time. I would also like to thank our esteemed panel, Professor Rachel Webster from the Faculty of Science, Associate Professor Jenny Weikart from FEIT, Dr. Anku Singh from NDHS. Your candid insights into the challenges facing women in STEM careers have been eye-opening. And the common theme I heard was to look at the person uh, holistically, not just the career, because it is very important, and I think we, as women mentors, we should remember that. And I would also like to shout out the Women in Engineering program, which has really helped me get to where I am today. So as we reflect on today's fruitful revelations, let us remember that achieving gender equity is a collaborative effort. Each of us, regardless of gender, contributes significantly to creating a workplace in which everyone feels respected, encouraged, and empowered to pursue their passions. In celebrating women in STEM, we celebrate the collective achievements and advancements that arise from diverse perspectives. The barriers addressed today are not to be seen as insurmountable obstacles, but rather challenges that can be overcome. And as we consider this year's International Women's Day theme, Inspire Inclusion, we are encouraged to take these words at heart. When we inspire others to understand and value women's inclusion, we forge a better world. A world where potential of every individual is recognized and harnessed, regardless of their gender. Let's commit to being catalysts for positive change with our spheres of influence. The thoughts and insights shared today should not end here. They should motivate ongoing efforts to establish environments where diversity is not only embraced, but also celebrated. I would like to encourage each one of you to take action. If you heard something today that you found inspiring, please go and tell five people who weren't here today about it. Spread the knowledge, ignite conversations, and be a part of the ripple effect that can lead to meaningful change. Please also be on the lookout for the post-event survey that will be emailed to you. Your feedback is important and will help us improve for next year. Your input ensures that we continue to grow and enhance the impact of events like these. Thank you all for your participation and commitment to making a difference. Together, we shape 
more inclusive and equitable future for women in STEM. I hope you will have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you.